Today on CityCast Philly, there are 40,000 vacant lots across the city. Back in April, I spoke with an urban designer and planner who knows how to transform neglected spaces into something new. So how could we put empty land to good use in our neighborhoods? It's Thursday, August 31st. I'm Trinae Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Nate Hummel, you're the director of planning and design for University City District. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see an empty or neglected lot? First thing that comes to mind when I see a vacant lot, it looks like people don't care. And it's losing that basic thing we need is a sense of, of dignity when and sense of respect in our places that we that we exist in. And so when you see something like that, it just looks like people don't care. It seems like if you live on that block. It's like nobody cares about my block. This is forgotten space. And uh, it might be where you live. And that's uh, not a good feeling. Yeah. So, Nate, you also have been a landscape architect for 20 years. When a community decides, you know, they they want to develop an unused space or a neglected space, what's the first thing they should do? Well, the first thing they should do is organize. When you are, something is not right and you want to do something about it, get some people together, get some other minds together and then see what, what do people want to see there? And so it's bringing people together. Okay. There's different voices. Great. There's a couple of ideas of things we want to do here. Then what should we do? In Philadelphia, because of our uh, council system with city council folks, often that's the next best step. Go talk to your district council person. Say, okay, we have this group of people. They're interested in helping out on this blighted property. Constituent services for XYZ council member. What could we do to get some attention on this? And so that's really, that that kind of gets things going. That gets people talking. Gets people thinking, okay, something could happen. Something might change. You don't know when or how long it's going to take. But I'd say that's the first thing to do. Get some folks together. Talk to your district council people, get their advice on the next steps, how to deal with vacant lot strategies in your community. Okay, great. What about if someone already owns that land? What should we do? The owner would need to determine where do you want to go with this property today, tomorrow, further down the road. Um, and then maybe that that owner can start engaging the folks in that community and start saying, hey, I have this property. I'm not sure what I want to do with it. What are some needs in the community? What are some things you folks say we don't have? I wonder if I could get that going on my lot. So if you have a visionary, thoughtful landowner, um, that's a great strategy for engaging those folks and getting that party started from the ground up. Um, the worst thing that can happen with these is top-down strategies, where it's like, this is what we're going to do with every vacant lot. Mm. This is how we we are the omniscient overlords. We know all these things. That's not good. That never works, and it usually leads to people feeling disenfranchised. And so the thing to do is get that local get that local commitment. Get get folks on the ground that care, talking about it, getting that conversation started. That's how the momentum builds. Interesting. So I hear you also mention time frame for a particular project, right? So Nate, what are the pros and cons of maybe something permanent versus a short-term solution for this unused space? Yeah. So I use actually two different terms, permanent and non-permanent. And so when you have permanent installations on things, that is something that is always going to be there. And maybe it is prescribed in advance. Okay, this is what we are doing. We want this and it's going to be put in stone or concrete or hard finished materials. When we're talking about non-permanent, those are things that just might have the heft of permanence, but they're not technically there forever. They could be moved somewhere else, say, if that lot gets developed. I think some of our biggest mistakes in Philadelphia have been immediately going to a permanent solution. Something that is changing, you know, it's different than what it was before. And now here we are with a permanent fix. That might not work. That neighborhood might change in five years. Those new folks might not want that thing there mm-hmm. anymore. So if you have things that are non-permanent, they can adjust over time as that community maybe grows. If you can use some non-permanent space, 
for a little while, you can learn things. People tell you, I don't like that, or that's not working right, or I don't think that's going to work. So maybe you could do this. So you make those adjustments over time with your non-permanent things. And that gives you a better idea of what could really work in the long term here. So Nate, what could happen in those non-permanent spaces? Wonderful question, because there's often things that come up. For example, people say, vacant lot, we need something. I think, put a community garden here. I think, put a dog park here. Those are two things I would really be cautious about activating a vacant lot with those things. Those only work if that can become the permanent use in that vacant lot. If you work real hard to get a dog park put in a vacant lot, and it's a temporary use, and in year three, the developer says, I'm putting my house there, and you lose your dog park, there will be an uproar. Vacant lot strategies need to keep in mind the the end use of that space. If it is always going to be that new use that you are then activating it with, then that's a wonderful space for a community garden to build, build community, bring people in. It's a wonderful space for a dog park if that's what the community wants. Those are good ideas, but be very cautious of those because if you have to take those things away, then you could become the enemy totally by accident. Nate, where do you come in during this process? How do you take community feedback and begin to transform a space? Where I focus is on public space. And so we try and put public space in areas that were previously underutilized. Our major space, the porch at 30th Street Station, uh, that big uh, bunch of colorful tables and chairs outside of 30th Street Station. That's our big experiment. That was the city Mm -hmm. back in 2011, had a 50 foot wide by 500 foot wide sidewalk and said, "Uh, what are we going to do with this thing? We don't have any idea. UCD came in and said, hey, we're going to try a couple of things. We're going to put down some planters and some tables and chairs and see how it goes. We did an initial 1.0 installation of tables, chairs and planters back in 2011. We've done several different iterations over the years. We've added shade structures. We've added swings. We've added a few different things over the years. Uh, But we've added them as we learned about the space, as we learned about the users of the space, as they started to tell us, hey, you know, we need more shade. Hey, we would like more of this, more of that, or less of this, or less of that. We make adjustments to that space based on user feedback. And that has been something we can actually relay in other areas of our work. And so it started with the underutilized space in front of 30th Street Station, but it's also morphed into uh, safe crossing distances in commercial corridors on Baltimore Avenue. We've done a couple of different, what we call pedestrian plazas uh, to make sure it's safe for everybody. But what we do is we put some stones and planters out in the street that is effectively extending the sidewalk which effectively reduces the crossing distance for people to get across those streets. And so, again, the trick is perfect is the enemy of done. If you're trying to do the most perfect thing, it is not going to come out for a very long time. Just try something. Give it your best effort. Try and do something good. Try and make some installation. Then get feedback from people. Hear what they think. Make adjustments. Go in and do something different the next season. Now. I feel like I've seen or I hear a lot about community gardens, right? But they take a lot of time. And if I'm working, you know, eight hour shifts, 12 hour shifts, I may not be able to put in the work that's needed to maintain that space. So are there low maintenance solutions for a non-permanent space? Yeah. So there's, you know, the whole world of community gardens where there's wonderful culture around it. People share the plants that grow, all those wonderful things, but they do take a deep commitment. And so maybe that doesn't work for every every place. Uh, there's lots of different strategies for kind of getting at that idea, but not doing it all the way. So you can do raised vegetable beds where you're just doing simple, simple things, bringing in some plants or vegetable starts. You could do something as simple as that and have an impact in a place. So my caution is it does not have to be that beautiful community garden you've seen in a magazine. It can just the smallest amount of plants in a space of desirable plants can make it feel like someone cares about this space. Something as simple as flower bulbs that can cost 50 cents a piece. You install that in the fall, they become beautiful flowers in the spring. I think the trick is don't get overwhelmed 
by the best community garden you've ever seen. Think about what is one thing I can do to make an impact here. Maybe it's adding a bench. Maybe it's adding a trash can. Maybe it's adding a tree so there's some shade. Just think about what is the intervention here that can help make people feel a little bit of a a higher sense of dignity when they walk by this space. It doesn't have to become the world's best park. Nate, do you have any recommendations or suggestions for maybe cheap solutions? There are the lowest cost solutions available, depending on how long you want it to be there. If you want to do a weekend activation of this space and say, hey, we're going to try something out on Sunday, this even works, bales of hay could work as benches. The simplest thing, $5 for something like that. That could be the easiest possible solution. Up from there, the next step is, is making things out of wood. If you make things out of wood, it's a little bit lower cost than other materials. It doesn't last forever, but it lasts a long time. And if you really find something good, that's when you move up into metal. And metals are harder and more expensive, but they last a lot longer. They're more durable. They can move easier from one site to the next. And so that's that range. Metal's going to be the most expensive and the hardest to do, but you can do low cost things that are with found materials. You can do things that are benches and chairs that you found somewhere else to activate this space. So honestly, there are really low cost solutions to this. It depends on what you want it to be. That's great. Nate, I got to get your recommendations of your favorite examples of a creative use of a vacant lot around the city. To me, the most exciting thing that has ever happened to our vacant lots was when Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, PHS, about a decade ago said, What if we did beer gardens and vacant lots? That has completely altered things. We now have this roving beer garden thing called Parks on Tap that roves around through multiple parks throughout the city. I think they combined the beauty of plants, of horticulture, with some food and some beverages, but it was gathering places. They were places that people could hang out. I think the most successful one was years ago was on South Broad. I think that was their first one. Now it's a big skyscraper. But it once was a derelict, empty, vacant lot. And they activated it with this PHS pop-up beer garden. And it was it really changed things. It, it made people think very differently about vacant lots from that point forward. I guarantee it. Nate Hummel, you're the director of planning and design for University City District and a landscape architect. Thank you so much for being on CityCast Philly. Thanks for having me. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. If you enjoyed this episode about vacant lots, tell your neighbor, rate the show, leave us a review, and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about. We'll be back tomorrow morning with a special episode from our live show. Bye. Bye.